Hey, hi, and thanks for coming. My name is Eric Hitchery. Um, since this is Genelia, I figured I needed a picture of a brain, uh, but that will be the last brain that you see uh, for this talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the science and I'll actually also the art of fire, but uh, first I'd like to say some very important thank yous. Um, everything you see here has been blessed and approved by, I, by uh, EHNS. Uh, so I'd especially like to thank uh, Josh, who's been going back and forth with emails on me for a couple months now. Uh, Marla, who's going to be our uh, special experimenter, she's warned. Uh, and also uh, Caroline Sheedy, who poked and poked and poked and poked. Uh, and I don't know that a postdoc has actually done a science for everyone before, but um, enough poking got me to do this, and so uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, in full disclosure, you're going to see a lot of awesome things today, but I also hope that you learn some things about chemistry and physics. Um, so I'm going to trick you, full disclosure. Uh, but I want to start off with the question of what is fire? It is a quintessential human creation, and it's the first chemical reaction that man ever really controlled. Uh, but what is it? And this is actually, I want this to be a little bit of a conversation with you guys because not just scientists, but I believe all humans are really good at observation. So raise your hand and tell me something you observe about fire. I'll start off, it's hot. But if, if people can help me out and just tell me some things that you know or think about fire. It burns, that's very important. Solids turn to vapor, you saw the next slide. Uh, light, excellent. Color. Anybody else? So these are all really good observations. Um, so we've said some of these things. Uh, there's also smoke and soot. Uh, the vaporizing is there's less fuel that you are burning after you're done with it. And really fire just comes down to four uh, chemical processes. And they're all big words, but I'm going to go through them and, and take a little tour with you. So first what happens is pyrolysis. And this comes from combining uh, pyro, which is fire, and lysis, which is separating. And this is actually uh, when fuels vaporize. And so uh, you get something called volatile gases. And this is what burns. Uh, and this process is used to create charcoal. So this is where the smoke is. That's why charcoal doesn't throw off a lot of smoke, because all these volatile gases ha have already been essentially burned off. Also, if you've ever caramelized something, or uh, those nice grill marks, the Maillard reaction, that's this process as well. So next is chemiluminescence, a little bit more uh, easy to understand. And this is giving off light from a chemical reaction. Uh, and this happens when electrons in an atom, so an atom is composed of protons and neutrons in the middle, and then electrons are on the outside. And through uh, chemical processes, these electrons can go to an excited state or back down to a less excited state. And when this happens, sometimes they can emit photons, and there's certain chemical reactions where this actually happens. Uh, and the part of the uh, flame that you can, where you can see this going on, oops, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Uh, is this blue part of the flame down here? And it's actually quite cool. Uh, this is the same type of chemical reaction that is uh, behind glow sticks and fireflies. It's this uh, photons being emitted from a chemical reaction. It's not very hot. What is hot? is oxidation. It's also called combustion. So an internal combustion engine is really focused on this. And this is when oxygen and hydrogen atoms change places and form new molecules. Uh, this is the process that happens behind rust. It's much slower, so it's not uh, nearly as hot as we perceive a fire to be. Uh, but as this recent uh, cartoon from XKCD shows, oxidation can take many, many forms. Um, it also is how you burn calories in your body. 
and we know that uh, that gives off heat. And then finally, incandescence. This is what most of us probably think of when it comes to a flame, and that's the glowing part up here. And in this sense, flame is actually a solid. So that heat giving off by the combustion, the oxidation reaction, is uh, being absorbed by these soup particles, tiny, tiny uh, little bits of carbon and, and uh, other atoms that have formed molecules with carbon, and they glow, just like an incandescent light bulb. Uh, it's heated up, so it glows. Or if you have a hot iron, uh, same sort of thing. Uh, so I've took you, taken you through the terms, uh, and I found actually a wonderful video. This, the process of what a flame is uh, was thought to be uh, such an interesting question that Alan Alda, who was right where I stand uh, a couple years ago, he created a, a science education pro competition. And it, the first question was, uh, what is a flame? I'm going to show you the winner because I can't really do any better. Uh, but he wrote a, a very catchy song, a little bit too catchy, uh, that I'm going to play for you guys just to uh, help help you understand, help you remember the four steps. The fuel loses mass; it turns to a gas before the next changes through. Some atoms shine blue when the process is complete. It gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow, red, orange, yellow. Loses mass, it turns to a oh, gas yeah. before the next changes through. Some atoms shine oh, blue yeah. when the process is complete. It gives off oh, heat. Yeah. This leads us to leads me to ask a question. Um, so some of you see this and have taken some chemistry and probably know what's coming up. Uh, so sodium is a metal. Uh, you combine it with chloride to make your table salt. Um, but water is used to put out fires. However, I know based upon this equation, and you can take my word for it or work it out yourself, that if I combine sodium and water. I get a, a very strong oxidation reaction. Uh, it gives off hydrogen, gives off a lot of heat. So I want to ask the question, what happens if we combine sodium and water? Uh, so I'm going to do that right now. Hold on just a second. So this is sodium, elemental sodium. Uh, thankfully, it's a very soft metal. I can actually cut it with a scalpel. So that will be the most dangerous thing I do today with these big heavy gloves on. Uh, I'm not used to the gloves. Sorry about that, guys. So this is sodium metal. It's actually, what you're seeing is uh, an oxidized form of it. Uh, because it actually, hopefully we can see this in the camera, it actually, glow, it actually has a very shiny edge on it. So I can just cut right through it. You can see it's, I think you can see, it's fairly shiny. And what I'm going to do is just cut off a small piece, and we'll see what happens. Should have had some music for the cutting. 
All right. Um, if anyone wants to take a picture or leave before there's an explosion, now is your time to do it. And so that's giving off hydrogen, and if it creates enough heat, no. Oh. Woo! There we go. I was waiting for the boom. All right. Just gonna put this away. So, as you've probably heard from many uh, um, firemen and fire safeties, uh, this is actually kerosene. Which this is the probably the weirdest uh, using kerosene to make sure there's no fire water to create one, um, but that just shows you that you can't always use the same rules uh, when it comes to um, treating fires. So um, yeah, that's what happens when you put sodium in, in water. I've been wanting to do that for uh, since I was a little kid. So that. <laughs> Really use this as an excuse to, to do that presentation. All right. Question. Uh, so what's in there now is uh, some smoke, some water vapor, and the sodium actually combined with uh, oxygen and hydrogen to make lye, so the active ingredient in industrial soap. Uh, it's diluted, so it's not so strong. You could probably wash your hands with it, but Probably better you didn't. Uh, and what I should have said is, don't try this at home. Um, try to. <laughs> Jerry's not here. That wasn't on purpose, but. Uh, so that brings us, and I really wanted this date because it was nice and close to Fourth of July. People are grilling, and there's a lot of debate out there as to. Um, really what you should do uh, to heat your meat up. So on the left here, we've got the traditional charcoal. It's nice. It's got the fire that everyone is used to and what I just showed you. However, uh, I'm really a big fan of this one on the left. And what makes it different is this can, which is filled with propane. And what is propane? Uh, so propane is a hydrocarbon. Uh, it has everything that, from early on, we really like for a fire. So it's got lots of hydrogen that's available for that oxidation reaction. And it's got some carbon to keep that heat and that incandescence. Uh, and one thing that it is not, that some of you might think it is, is that it doesn't have any smell. So what you're actually smelling uh, is ethanethiol, which is detectable at, a, at such a fine dilution, uh, much finer than ammonia. If you've ever smelled ammonia, it's got a very strong smell. It's actually 6,500 times more detectable than ammonia. So they dope that with just a little bit, and that's what you actually smell uh, when there's a propane leak or when you first turn on your propane tank. So why use propane? Uh, it burns really well for all those reasons I just described. It's also readily available. Uh, we get it largely from the same process that we get uh, petroleum uh, or natural gas. But the, those reasons are really dependent upon uh, our interest and our love of petrochemicals. But these next four, the ability to control fire, the ability for the fuel source to be distant from the fire, um, and to get a lot of fuel into a small volume, are all thanks to a couple of gas laws that I'd like to teach you guys about. Um, so I'm going to start off and really focus on a law called Charles's Law which says that the temperature of a gas is proportional uh, to the volume that it takes up. It was discovered, oddly enough, by a guy uh, named Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac. And you might say, well, why, why not name it after him? It's because he already had a, a gas law named after him, uh, which is fairly similar. It's that the temperature of a volume of gas correlates with the pressure. Um, and pressure is the outward force that uh, 
a gas exerts. So if you ever blow up a balloon, that's the pressure of the gas that's pushing outside on it. Um, and Gay-Lussac was actually a very um, interesting scientist. He f was the first one to discover that water was two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. He's one of only 72 names inscribed on the Eiffel Tower. And he also developed the uh, alcohol by volume rule of judging alcohol content that is now used the world over. Um, so <laughs> cheers to him. I'm a big fan of, of Gay-Lussac. Um, but let's get to really what the, the rules mean. Uh, so uh, here we have the same, uh, the same uh, gas. So when it's colder up here, it'll take up less space and exert less pressure outwards. However, if you heat it up, it will expand. Uh, and this is uh, why if you've ever used a propane tank for your barbecue, if, you've, if it's been on for a while, why that tank gets cold. It's because of this same property. Also, it's why sweat, sweating cools you down. So as you go from a very condensed liquid state of that liquid on your skin to evaporation, you're losing so much of this heat. Um, and so that's what helps keep you cool when you sweat. So really interesting rule, a lot of ways to apply it. Um, the way we apply it in the case of propane is that the propane, which is in a gas form, is cooled to minus 162 degrees centigrade. That's halfway between room temperature, where we are now, and absolute zero, where nothing moves, no molecule even moves. Except I think there was a paper that came out a couple months ago that said there might be a little bit of movement. But that's really, really, really cold. So what happens then, if you make something that cold, is it will condense. And when it gets so condensed, it will turn from a gas to a liquid. And the, ga the liquid in your propane tank, because that's what you have, it's a liquid inside of there, is 270 times atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure of the gas in this room where we are now. Just for a, a little standard, the gas in your uh, tires is only 2.5 times atmospheric pressure. Uh, so that's a whole lot more pressurized. Um, and this is just a, a picture. If you've ever driven by uh, an oil refinery or natural uh, gas building. This is what's called a condenser. And these tubes here, which are used to maximize the surface area so that you can get things colder quicker, is used to condense that gas down to a solid. So this brings us to our next what if. Um, so sound is just pressure waves. Um, so if I have a tube full of air, for instance, this tube here, and I put a speaker at one end of it. What's that, the sound is actually the compression of gas molecules and the expansion of gas molecules. So if, if these are gas molecules here, that's roughly what it would look like. Now, what would be a good way to sample to see, is this actually what's happening? Because you shouldn't believe me. You should always do the experiment, find out for yourself. Well, one option will be to take the tube, cut a bunch of holes into it, fill it with propane, and then light it on fire. Uh, so a question to you guys. If I uh, light a fire over this hole, and you know what's going on in this column of gas, should this flame be big or small? Good. And this one? Awesome. Let's try this out. So uh, what really should happen is this. This is what you guys were kind of thinking of. That you would see what looks kind of like a standing wave, right? Excellent. We're going to try this out. So what I have here is just a steel tube. It's sealed. and I've got a propane tank down here. And like I said, there's a bunch of small holes up here. Uh, and for safety's sake, especially because we're inside, uh, the gas regulator is set very low. So if all the holes don't light up, I'm sorry. Uh, Set. So I'm going to let the gas build a little bit of pressure. It's heavier than air, so it sits in the bottom, and then it's got to come up. Mm -hmm. That's not good.
Uh, when we were doing this earlier, it takes a while for the propane to, so what's happening is it's got to purge all the oxygen out. So bear with me for a little bit. We didn't want to keep a volume of propane going into the room. There we go. So this is quite low, uh, but we can still work with it, I hope. So I'm going to turn on the sound. It's going to be a little bit loud. So there we go. Hey, guys, backstage, can you turn off the house lights or dim them down just a little bit? And the projector. Uh, I might be able to do something about that. There we go. All right, so what I'm going to do is play a pure tone. Uh, it's going to be a little bit loud. Uh, and it, we're going to sweep through several frequencies. So at this point in time, the, uh, the length of the sound waves is so long that you can't actually see all of one uh, of uh, one wavelength at once. So it's a little long over there, it's long over here, and it's actually where the nodes of sound come together. So now that node is moving. So now it's forming the, the discrete peaks. Stop it there. So you guys might have noticed some of those some of the times it seemed like everything snapped into place and you had a had a really nice uh, peak for just a little bit. That's actually the harmonics of the tube itself that are providing that little bit of extra oomph. If anyone's familiar with harmonics of sound, that's what's going behind that. Um, now, pure tones are nice, and they let us see the science, uh, but I wanted to do something a little bit more interesting and up-to-date.
Probably one more song. Just uh, so it, what you guys noticed was that the flame was changing based upon the amplitude uh, rather than the pitch making it work. So uh, the other sound that the way that sound works is that it's not just the wavelength but also the amplitude. So that's what was causing those bursts on the louder bits. So I'm going to try one more song that has uh, uh, a bit more of the higher notes so that we can actually see the nice frequencies, I hope. All right, I hope you saw that it shifted a little bit with the tone. Can I get the house lights back up? All right, so that's actually called the Rubens tube, different spelling than Jerry, uh, but it's been around since 1905. Uh, as a way to experiment with sound waves. Um, did we go? Oh, here we go. Uh, so wanted to show show you another fun little thing that uh, I'm sure the H and S wouldn't allow me to do. Um, and that's uh, ask another question about gas and heat uh, and pressure and density. So I'm going to show you a video here. And this is a metal ceiling about 10 feet up in the air. And you'll see there's several points where there's actually propane gas that's being fed down straight upon the viewer. And I want you to try and figure out uh, why the viewer isn't engulfed in flames. It's a really pretty video. And this is in full speed. So propane gas is actually much heavier than air. So it should fall. And in fact, we were working with the, the safety we have a fan in here to make sure that the gas doesn't pool on the ground uh, and create a fire hazard. So if gas is, if propane is much heavier than air, does anyone have any idea, although you're probably just mesmerized watching what's going on on the screen, anyone have any idea why it looks like it's pooling on the ceiling? Anyone? I think I heard it. Right, heat. So remember, if, so, if a gas is hotter, it will expand and that be, that makes it less dense. So that's what causes this propane gas to pool on the ceiling instead of on the ground. And you get these really beautiful effects. Uh, in this case, it, uh, this uh, piece is called Incendia by a team of artists out of Baltimore. Uh, but there's been several others. So another question about that would be, uh, here's a flame on Earth. What do you think would happen if you had this flame in outer space? And I've got to say, if there's any worse idea than having flames inside at your work, a flame in outer space is probably the absolute worst that you could do. However, they did this experiment. Does anyone have any ideas about what this flame would look like if it were in outer space with all the oxygen and everything that it needed? I see it. Right. So it would go round. So this is a flame in microgravity. 
And what you can really see well here is uh, the chemiluminescence that are given off by the electrons um, in those atoms. So it's, it's nice and round, it glows blue. And that's why uh, heat doesn't actually rise. Things that are less dense rise from buoyancy. And that's why this hot part up here, like I was telling you about, it is up and why a flame burns up. It's nice and cool down here because less dense things, things that are hotter, rise. That actually brings us um, to our last um, experiment fun time. So this is a, a diagram. If you were to cut open your propane tank uh, and have it not explode, uh, this is uh, essentially what it would look like. So here's a propane tank, and you have propane molecules. And with most of the propane in the tank being liquid, it's very condensed. Uh, so that's uh, these dense uh, purple dots in here. And what actually happens is, uh, because of the change in pressure, uh, the propane actually evaporates off the top of the tank and goes out the tube to the flame. And that brings us to the what if. What happens if we were to block uh, this evaporation and just pull up what happens? So the size of your fire, like here, is really limited by how fast you can evaporate off of that tank. That's why if you've ever used those camping stoves with the one pound tanks, you really can't get that big of a fire out of it because only, there's only so much volume or so much surface area for the gas to evaporate off of. 20 pound tanks are bigger. If anyone has lived out in a cabin, has a 50 pound tank, that can power an entire house. Uh, but what would happen if you stopped up the tank uh, and then in a quick burst released all of this propane, which is it pressurized but just less than what it takes to uh, cause the propane to freeze. The answer, you're going to get a really, really big flame. Um, so Marl is outside. <laughs> hey, Marla. <laughs> Go for it. Can the camera back up a little bit? Yeah, I can't see the flame. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't a good idea. Go for it again. So this is about a 10-foot flame. Uh, it is, uh, what happens is there's an accumulator. Do as much as you want, Marla. Have fun. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see it against the sky so well. Um, and this will be set up after the talk if anyone wants to go out, take some selfies with a big flame. Um, but what this is is uh, there's an accumulator tank that keeps all this gas pent up. Uh, and then Marla just throws a switch right there and has a good old time, doesn't burn her hair. Um, and so it's through techniques like this as well as techniques that many of you in the audience have with, say, Arduinos and valves and even A to D converters and solenoids uh, can actually come back. Thanks, Marla. <laughs> Hopefully she's okay. Uh, so there, there's a whole school of artists out there doing fire art uh, that are taking these chemical and physics principles of Charles Law, Gay-Lussac Law, the gas laws, and the ideas of what burns, propane does a really good job, and combining them with Arduinos and solenoids and all sorts of uh, really great uh, sort of mechatronics type of things, and making some really nice, really big art. Uh, so this is called Pupo Mechanico, um, and he can, they can turn on and off all of those flames, and they actually went down to Mexico to junkyard and repurposed all of the metal that's in there. Um, and then uh, this snake down here has a nice uh, moving, undulating backbone by doing pulses of the propane. And then, not to be outdone, I actually take the poofer that's outside, put a different regulator on it because I'm not at work, uh, that does about a 20-foot flame and mount it onto a tuba, a sousaphone, because why not? It kind of looks like a cannon anyways. 
And so I perform all over with this. It's a totally normal sousaphone. It's a totally normal flame poofer. Not a, not that anyone cares here, but it's not a flame thrower. Flame thrower is liquid gas. So if, if you put your hand in here, it's not a good experience. But if it's liquid gas, that's going to continue to burn and burn and burn. It's a, it's a weapon. This is art. Um, <laughs> trust me. Uh, and I, I'm not that creative, so this is me with uh, my fire tuba, and this is actually the original creator of The Simpsons, the original illustrator, David Silverman. Uh, so we get together and play. He's actually the original guy. Um, so it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great things out there. And I hope that in this talk I've shown you, one, not only what, uh, what you can do in terms of the chemistry of fire and the physics of fire, but also the art of fire. Um, so on that, uh, summarize, so fire is pyrolysis, turning solid into gas so that it can be burned, chemiluminescence, which is that nice blue cool glow at the bottom, and that can change colors uh, depending on what you're burning. It's actually the original, one of the original analytical chemistry tools that we had. Oxidation, which is uh, the, in this case, the very rapid recombination of oxygen and hydrogen and carbon molecules. And then the incandescence, which is actually just glowing really, really small particles. And that's the suit that you see if you have a candle underneath uh, of something. And then the, two, the in particular, the two gas laws, that the volume of a gas will change with temperature and the pressure that's existed, that exerts, uh, that is exerted outwards by that gas to change with that temperature. So without further ado, thank you so much. I'll try and field any questions if you had them. And afterwards, if you want to try out the flame proof, it's right outside the, uh, right outside. So thank you.